Americans an enchanting island territory 2,000 miles from the mainland. To the Japanese, Pearl Harbor, an enemy bastion. For two years, Europe has been at war. But in Honolulu, people talk of pineapples, sugar cane, money and tourists. The year is 1941. There is still time for one more aloha. Still time to enjoy tropical skies and sweet music, flowered lays, and the hula. Pacific Island, beyond the international date line, events which will change the course of history are maturing with reckless rapidity. Tokyo, the brain of the Japanese Empire, looks brisk, efficient, modern, as is proper for the capital of the most thoroughly industrialized nation in the East. Simultaneously, two opposed levels of culture exist side by side, Oriental and Occidental. Social, economic, and religious ideas from an isolated past survive with superimposed industrial methods and western ways. The face of Japan is baffling. A strange mixture of the very ancient with the brand new. But one face is familiar. The world has learned to recognize aggression. Japan is marching. Techniques she has learned so well from the west are harnessed into ideas cultivated in the east. Japan's divine mission to bring the eight corners of the world under one roof. Ushido, the sacred code of the warrior, the glory of conquest. First Japan conquered Manchuria. Later she struck China. Incident after incident, victory after victory, forging her new empire, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. The world is beginning to catch the ominous sound of a strange new word. Bonsai. But behind bright banners and arrogant words, the Japanese high command ponders a dilemma. To realize the dreams of conquest, the war machine must have the oil of Southeast Asia. Japan has none. With the European powers locked in a war of survival, America's Pacific fleet is the major obstacle to Japanese domination of Asia and the Pacific. The ruling militarists hatch a faithful plan to eliminate the obstacle. Sink the United States Navy. Guns are sighted on Pearl Harbor, the key to America's defense in the Pacific, the headquarters of the United States Pacific Fleet. Japan knows the attack she is planning means war. But if she sinks the principal striking force of the United States Navy, the prize is worth the risk. Such bold designs demand hard study and exact intelligence. The Hawaiian Island was scrutinized, especially Oahu, with its principal targets. Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, the major airfields, installations of every kind, forts, naval bases, warehouses, dry docks. Every military factor of importance is pinpointed for the coming attack. But the heart of the assault will center on Ford Island in the middle of Pearl Harbor, around which the American fleet is moored. Intelligence reports, main enemy force here, destroyers here, cruisers, converted target ship Utah, seaplane tender. There is little the Japanese do not know in advance. The Navy's finest pilots are picked to deliver the assault, which will be carried out entirely by carrier-based aircraft. Technically and emotionally, their indoctrination is as perfect as human ingenuity can make it.
By late October 1941, dress rehearsals for the attack are secretly staged over terrain chosen for its resemblance to Pearl Harbor. Air crews hold repeated, highly realistic maneuvers, perfecting their teamwork, practicing approaches, sharpening their marksmanship. Plans and decisions become orders and action. Events move with relentless precision toward their climax. In early November, Admiral Yamamoto, designer of the Pearl Harbor attack, orders his striking force to advance into Hawaiian waters and upon the very opening of hostilities, attack the main force of the United States fleet. On November 16th, the ships, singly and in small groups, slip out to sea to rendezvous in a hidden harbor in the remote Kuril Islands, far north of Tokyo. A week later, the Pearl Harbor striking force is assembled and weighs anchor for Hawaii, 4,000 miles and 12 days away. The task force maintains radio silence and travels a roundabout course off normal shipping lanes. Dirty weather and heavy seas help bail its progress. never before been so powerful a striking force in the Pacific. Two fast battleships, six of Japan's newest and finest carriers, a screen of eight destroyers, three cruisers and three submarines. Aboard the carriers are 40 torpedo bombers, 135 dive bombers, 104 horizontal bombers, and 81 strafing planes. A total of 360 aircraft. Preparing themselves for the attack, pilots pause at Shinto shrines to renew their dedication to the spirits of their ancestors. On every flight deck, pilots receive last minute intelligence on Pearl Harbor. They prepare to strike for the glory of Japan. Admiral Nagumo, commander of the task force, delivers a final message from Imperial headquarters in Tokyo. Niitakayama Nobore. Climb Mount Niitaka. The code to attack. Westerly trade is blowing, and the helmsmen swing their carriers into the wind for launching the planes. Latitude 26 degrees north, longitude 158 degrees west. The launching point. Pearl Harbor lies 275 miles to the south. It is 0600. It is X day.
thousand miles away in Washington, it is almost noon. At the Navy Department, intelligence experts have had a puzzling Sunday morning. Some time ago, they broke Japan's most carefully guarded code. They've deciphered a dispatch from Tokyo to the Japanese Embassy. Secret instructions reject America's request for mediation in the Far Eastern crisis. Order negotiations broken off. Exactly what this means, no one knows. The State Department is uneasy. Secretary Cordell Hull awaits another crucial conference with the Japanese ambassador and a special envoy from Tokyo scheduled for one o'clock. The Japanese ask for a 45-minute postponement. But there is no delay in the flight of their warplanes toward Hawaii. weather good, visibility clear, slowly life begins to stir on the island. practices as he waits for the breakfast truck. He picks up planes approaching from the north and tracks them for a few minutes before reporting to Air Force Headquarters, Hickam Field. But the planes are thought to be American. Ten minutes to eight. December 7th, 1941.
planes depart. Never in modern history has a war begun with so smashing a victory. In one hour and 50 minutes, the Japanese have sunk or shattered eight battleships. Oklahoma, West Virginia, Arizona, Nevada, California, Tennessee, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Three cruisers and three destroyers and four smaller ships are sunk or battered. The Japanese have lost 29 planes. 68 of their pilots and sailors are dead and five midget submarines which tried to penetrate Pearl Harbor are beached or sunk. One of the cheapest military triumphs on record. Sixty-eight civilians, dead. One hundred and nine marines, dead. Two hundred and eighteen soldiers, dead. Two thousand and eight sailors, in Tokyo, the government loses no time in exploiting the news of Pearl Harbor, Japan's greatest victory. With pride, an autocratic regime informs an amazed population of its newly won prize. Propaganda carries on where the bombers left off. Japan's mission is being fulfilled. The eight corners of the world will be under one roof. The militarists have kept their promise. They have demonstrated the power of the Japanese Empire. They have done the impossible. Sunk the United States Navy. The head of their government, war minister and dictator Tojo, accepts a conqueror's laurels and rejoices with his subjects. are being flown in from the mainland. The most extraordinary salvage job in history begins. Hidden in the havoc wrought by the new enemy are the seeds of a miracle. With the dead lies the vision of a shattered fleet. Hidden in a pall of fire and smoke and the vengeance of the United States. Dead ships sail again. The fleet has arisen from Pearl Harbor.